So we're about to start. Thank you. Please take your seats. Thank you very much. We're about to start. Thank you. You said it is, yeah. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Sea to City Symposium, hosted by Nautilus International and Maritime London. My name is Helen Kelly, and it is my very great pleasure to be your host for today's event. The Sea to City Mentoring Scheme helps seafarers looking to make that move ashore to learn about opportunities in the maritime services sector. Today, you will hear real stories from seafarers who have made that move. You will hear from one second officer who is deep in the throes of making the move ashore as we speak, and you will hear from one mentor who is helping him to come ashore. You will also hear about some of the very real challenges that seafarers face in considering a move to shore. And you will also hear from Maritime Services Company in the difficulties they face in finding the talented people with the right skills for the jobs available. And of course, you will hear about how the Sea to City mentoring scheme, alongside other industry initiatives, is seeking to plug that gap. Alongside our live audience today, who have gathered at the Norton Rose Fulbright offices in central London, we are operating on Zoom, on Hopin, and on Facebook Live. Following our presentations, there will be ample opportunities to ask questions of all our speakers, both during and after the live event. You can also find more information on how to join the Sea to City Mentoring Scheme via the contact details provided at, on the main screen behind me. Now, I'd like to welcome Phil Parry, Board Member of Maritime London and Chairman of Spinnaker Global, to say a few words. Welcome, Phil. Thank you, Helen. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming this morning, for registering and appearing online. Um, yes, my name is Phil Parry. I'm not an ex-seafarer, um, but I've found jobs for many hundreds of them over the years. And so I hope to perhaps impart a little bit of my knowledge uh, and some correct some of the misunderstandings that surround this subject. Um, a little bit of background. I started out doing a maritime business and law degree and then qualified as a, a shipping lawyer practiced as a, a, a solicitor for a few years, and then set up Spinnaker Global in 1997. Our whole raison d'etre was to uh, work as a maritime recruitment company for shore-based jobs in shipping. And we soon discovered the pitfalls that many seafarers uh, encounter uh, when trying to make a move ashore. And um, I think if I were to summarize um, my career uh, and, and where I benefited it was very much from having a mentor who by pure coincidence phoned me today when I was on the train on the way to this event Michael Gray. Michael Gray uh, is was an ex-seafarer and, um, uh, and, and, and still has seafaring blood running through his veins and, and he wrote a book in 1982 called Changing Course which was a guidebook uh, for seafarers wishing to come ashore. Uh, nothing has been written since which eclipses it. It's a little outdated when you when you read it, but the messages, the main messages, remain absolutely sound. Uh, and the main thing I think that seafarers suffer from is the complete and utter lack of knowledge about the sea, uh, the shore-based industries, and what it is employers are looking for. So, having a mentor uh, enables you to get insider access, if you like, to to that knowledge. What is it employers are looking for? Uh, and what is it you need to do in order to make yourself look better than the next person to get that job ashore? Um, Michael Gray was my mentor, and, uh, and I appreciated that very, very, very much. And I think anyone who's looking to come ashore today should latch onto this scheme with two hands and, uh, and see if they can get some help. There's a lot of people out there giving well-meaning advice to seafarers looking to come ashore, and much of it is, is, is the wrong advice. You really do need to speak to people who've been there and done it, not necessarily been a seafarer and come ashore, but who've worked in the shore-based shipping industries. A lot of academics um, at, um, at Maritime College uh, and at Maritime Universities, uh, as I say, are very well-meaning, but they don't have that practical knowledge on the ground uh, in the shore-based industries to really tell you what's right and what's wrong, frankly. And I've had to correct lots of, um, sadly, wrong advice uh, over the years. 
So I'll try and chip in today with um, corrections if I need to at any point. But what I would say is that uh, one of the most important things is that as a seafarer, you need to provide evidence that you have what it is that employers are looking for. Uh, there's always, uh, I'm always asked, you know, should I, should I get a degree? And the answer is perhaps. Um, what you really should do is find out what the job it is that you're potentially interested in needs from you. It might be certain aspects of your personality. It might be written language skills. It might indeed be your seafaring technical knowledge. There are so many jobs out there that it's hard to give a, a, a one-stop shop piece of advice. Um, but your mentors, um, especially through being able to network with each other, ought to be able to help. So if there's a mentor in this room that doesn't know the answer to your question, they may be able to ask me, they may be able to ask Mark Glasgow, uh, and then we'll, you know, we'll give the appropriate advice. My company, Spinnaker Global, um, is, a, is a recruitment company that fills jobs at shore. It's not only jobs for seafarers. And I would say that probably 70% of seafarers coming ashore don't go through a company like mine. They go direct. Uh, and, uh, and they don't need a company like mine. Sometimes yes, sometimes no, but um, networking and getting to know people ashore is as important as registering with people like us. You know, in fact, I would urge you not just to register with people like us and rely upon us. You know, you need to do your own work as well. So treat coming ashore like a job uh, and work hard at it, prepare yourself, prepare the evidence that you need to prove to people that you have the skills that they're looking for. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. I can go on all day. I love the sound of my own voice. Um, but uh, I think there are people with more useful things to say than I. Um, uh, Mark Dickinson, um, uh, who is the Secretary General of Nautilus International, uh, and our co-host today is going to come up after me and, uh, and say his few words of welcome. Uh, I'd just like to thank you all on behalf of Maritime London uh, for um, uh, appearing today or taking part today. Um, but also just to quickly tell you about the Maritime London Officer Cadet Scholarship, uh, which is a charitable uh, trust uh, that uh, we at Maritime London run uh, and which provides uh, funding for uh, wannabe seafarers uh, through their cadetships. Uh, and the aim of that is to provide a pipeline of talent from sea, literally to city, not necessarily just to London, but to the UK maritime industries at large or indeed overseas. So if there's anybody watching this who wants to become a seafarer, wants a cadet, doesn't know how to go about it, needs some funding, then uh, do go to the Maritime London website and within that to the Maritime London Officer Cadet Scholarship section and get in touch with us. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Phil. And uh, I'd just like to make an aside there that Mike Gray was also very helpful for me when I joined Lloyd's List as a young cub reporter about 17 years ago. So he obviously gives a lot back to people. So I can I can second those sentiments. Uh, now, yes, I'd like to welcome uh, Mark Dickinson, General Secretary of Nautilus International to say a few words. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Helen. Thank you, Phil, for those kind words. Yes, uh, my name is Mark Dickinson and I'm General Secretary of Nautilus International. Good to see so many Friendly faces in the audience. Uh, many, of you, many of you I've met before uh, in my work um, uh, on behalf of the Union for Maritime Professionals. Let me just start by thanking Norton Rose Fulbright for making available these fantastic facilities with this. Well, uh, there are a few views um, in anywhere in the world that could match the one we are. Well, you've all got your backs to it, but anyway, I'm enjoying the view. And those of you online will just have to imagine uh, how the river looks uh, from. Uh, the, the offices on the top floor of uh, Norton uh, Rose Fulbright. That's two plugs for Norton. There's three plugs for Norton Rose Fulbright. Uh, so welcome, Norton International. Yes, the Union for Maritime Professionals, UK predominantly, but also the Netherlands and Switzerland. You might wonder about the last bit, but there's a very significant inland waterways industry and a very small strategic fleet of uh, deep sea vessels as well. Not too many Swiss seafarers, unfortunately. But our, our, our main base, UK, and in the Netherlands, where there's still, still a thriving maritime industry, which is wider than just the ships at sea, but those hugely significant clusters ashore, the, the maritime clusters, so important to an island nation and also to uh, the Netherlands with the port of Rotterdam being so significant as a gateway into, into Europe and the European Union. Nautilus is a founding member of Maritime London, so we were there from the beginning and was in support, particularly in support of the cadet scheme that Phil uh, has mentioned. 
I think for many people, uh, the the working in the industry and they start out perhaps don't really realize or the significance and the importance of their seafaring qualifications and the skills that they gain on the job and how much they are valued. They could be valued more, but they are valued in industries ashore with links to maritime. Uh, and they're in demand, which is why we're here uh, today. Those opportunities are significant and growing and sea to city uh, has been inspired as a concept by our members at our general meetings, because we're a democratic organization, our members set our, our agenda, and there's a couple in the room that you can talk to to confirm that. And they wanted us to support them in their transitions from sea to shore. When they're ready to come ashore, they wanted to be aware of the opportunities. They wanted to be, make connections to network. I think most of us in this room would understand the importance of networking in our industry is particularly important. My journey from sea to city has been, well, I would say amazing and incredibly fulfilling. But as we were discussing before with Paul and others and, and, and Philip uh, in, in the, uh, in the uh, earlier, um, before, we, before we went live, I didn't take any great strategic decision. I didn't start out as a young 16 year old growing up on Merseyside whose father went to sea. I had a connection with the sea and I lived very close to the sea. It was quite natural and normal for kids growing up on Merseyside with a, with, a, with a relative in the industry to say, well, that's a, that's a career that I will take. So yes, I had that connection. But after that, it just seems to be a series of either being in the right place at the right time or wrong time, depending on your perspective or just sheer good luck. Uh, my dad always told me that the people with most of the luck are the ones who work hard. And I always had a dedicated, I always worked hard. Um, so my journey from sea to city was probably driven partly by uh, luck, but also by hard work. But it has been an amazing and fulfilling experience. I stand in front of people uh, on a regular, regularly talking about this issue, and I will later in this week as well, uh, during London International Shipping Week. And I, and I say without fear of contradiction that I think this industry opens up so many opportunities, uniquely so, and I don't think there's any other career that will open up those opportunities. Whether you want to be a marine lawyer, maritime lawyer, and follow in Phil's footsteps, you want to be a shipmaster and go all the way and follow in Stephen's footsteps, or you want to come ashore in marine insurance, Fenner, I don't want to steal your thunder, but you're going to tell us your story. So I won't say any much more than that. Or you want to follow a route that Fenner has taken. Fenner and I have something in common. We both work for the Chamber of Shipping. Now, on that shock headline, because it might not surprise you that Fenner worked for the Chamber of Shipping, but it might surprise you that I did. Um, if you get me drunk, I'll tell you all, all about it. Um, you actually don't have to get me drunk, really. but We hope, uh, Phil and I, Maritime London, Joss, Debbie and Helen from Nautilus and my other colleagues from Nautilus International as well. We hope that when seafarers, are, seafarers of today, when they're ready to make the journey, when they're ready to move ashore, that this event will have inspired them to, to, to access mentors, supporters, knowledge, correct knowledge, the real experience to make that transition from sea to city. Because the nation needs seafarers. The pandemic has shown us that more than at any time since the Second World War, perhaps. Um, it is a, is, these are key workers. We need to support them. We need to provide more it's support for training and education of seafarers, and we need to uh, allow them to access that wider maritime cluster when they're ready to do so. So today is a really important springboard for that. And I emphasize the point that Phil made about anybody online, anybody here who wants to consider that wants to move ashore when they're ready and access the city city mentoring support network and uh, we'll be there for you alongside our partners maritime london and again thanks Jos, to you and your team and to phil and to olga and others who work from maritime london for supporting this thank you Helen. Lovely. I'm very glad that Mark didn't steal Fenner's thunder because it is now my very great pleasure to welcome Fenner Boyle to say a few words. Fenner was at sea for 8.5 years and uh, she is currently working as a surveyor at Aqualus Bremer LOC. So welcome Fenner. 
Morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Helen, and thank you to Maritime uh, London and Nautilus for having me today. I haven't prepared anything, so wish me luck. It's been a long weekend. Um, so, as Helen said, I spent eight and a half years at sea uh, and came ashore actually completely by accident. It wasn't in my plan. I don't think anyone necessarily plans their career from start to finish as we like to think we do when we first leave school. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, a couple of family bereavements and a need to be at home pushed me into, do I want to go back to sea? Probably not. Let's see what's around. And I ended up actually in a, uh, a company in the middle of the Oxfordshire countryside. Uh, couldn't be further from the sea, but it was still maritime, maritime security. I did that for a couple of months until they may be redundant, unfortunately, but I'll always be grateful to them for giving me my first step, first step shoreside. That first step, like we say, when you qualify as an officer and you need to get that first stamp, that first step is so helpful and so important. And whilst I wouldn't say take any job, I would say take the first, you know, the, the first real job that you can think of that gives you that opportunity to step ashore. Because it's not for life. I think people think when they step ashore, they must stay in that job for life. And as Mark said, there are so many opportunities that you don't have to. You know, if you don't like it, it's like being on a certain type of ship. You just change the type of ship you work on. We have exactly the same in this industry. Uh, I went from maritime security that I knew nothing about, quite frankly, into the MNTB, which I'm. I think Mark will back me up. I probably didn't know very much about either. Uh, but, you know, I ran careers at sea and careers at sea and beyond for three and a half years. And during that time, I realized that there's so little information to people about coming ashore. I definitely had that when I was coming ashore. I didn't know who to speak to, didn't know what to do. I wouldn't have found the job in the MNTV if it hadn't been for my partner. So uh, I should be grateful to him as well, I guess, for that. Uh, but if you don't know where to look, you don't know who to speak to, it can be an incredibly daunting, difficult process. And that's why programs like this are incredibly helpful. I'm also a coming ashore mentor. Um, and it's I've seen a huge reluctance from people to, to want to talk to people because they don't know who to talk to and what they should say or what questions to ask. You know, we always hear there's no such thing as a stupid question. And it's absolutely right when you come ashore. You know, ask the questions, speak to people, the networking, we all say it, but it is absolutely true. Go and network. And I'm here today because I know people in the room um, and I was lucky enough to, to get asked to do it. If you don't speak to people, you don't know what to expect. The journey you go on uh, does change. You never know what's coming. Uh, if it doesn't suit you, you can move. I'm so grateful for the opportunities that I've been given and the people that have supported my career. And that's one thing you, you definitely don't learn until you move ashore, that actually everyone is trying to help you and they, they do want to help. And if it's not right for you, they will help you find something else. Like Phil was saying, the advice that you get from people, it changes no matter who you speak to. I would say people can give you the wrong information. I definitely support that. But speak to those people anyway, because if you're getting that information, you can make the decision about what is the right information and the wrong information. No two journeys coming ashore are the same. And that's what makes it so difficult to be able to help people to come ashore. If it was simple that you just did A, B, C to D and it all ended up in the same place, well, it wouldn't be the maritime industry. It'd be pretty boring. Uh, but that's the struggle we face in helping people come ashore. And it's the struggle you face in coming ashore that we just, we just don't know where to start. So ask the questions, speak to people, get out there, go to your local maritime centre, go join every organisation you can, get involved in the LinkedIn um, groups and events, go to everything. Shipping Week is brilliant for that. Um, I'm very excited to be here for, I think it's my fourth Shipping Week now. And it's so nice to actually see people in real life, but also getting back out and, and renewing those relationships that have gone quiet for 18 months. Um, but to those thinking about coming ashore, there will be no right time. It will always be a, is this right for me? Is this wrong for me? Trust your gut. Know that you're doing it for you. Make sure you have the right reasons. Don't just come ashore because you think you have to or because it's not working. Really, really believe in what you're doing and what you're saying. Um, and if you don't agree with one job offer that's there for you or if there's certain things that you don't like about being, so if you don't want to go out, you know, at the short notice, a call that's on a whim, then don't go for a job that's going to call you out on a whim. You know, if you're not interested in maritime law, then don't go and talk to any of the law. It sounds stupid, but there'll be the jobs that are there available to you. Don't just take anything. Really think about it. 
because if you do come ashore and you haven't thought about it and you do those jobs that you're not going to enjoy, you're going to regret it. And then you're going to find it even harder to work out what the next step is. But know that the industry is here to support you and we're all here. Get a mentor, speak to people and uh, yeah, take that advice, good or bad, and make your own decision. Um, that's it for me. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you, Fenner. And you said the word daunting, uh, which really came to my mind when you were speaking. Everybody is scared to walk into that room for the first time, aren't they? No matter how many times we've all been to Shipping Week, it's always daunting to walk into that room for the first time when you don't know anyone. But it's so rewarding to do it because you will meet people who you'll just have a chance encounter with and you don't know where it's going to end up. So thank you very much for that, Fenner. I really appreciate that. I'd now like to welcome David Appleton, Professional and Technical Officer at Nautilus International to say a few words. David is also an ex-seafarer who is now working ashore and he can tell us a little bit about his journey. Welcome, David. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Helen. Yeah, my name's David Appleton. I'm Professional and Technical Officer at Nautilus International. Um, just give you a, a sort of overview of my career and how I ended up up here where I am now um, and the, sort of my experience of coming ashore, what difficulties I experienced and the, and how I think this scheme can go some way to, to help in those. So um, like like Mark, I didn't really have any um, you know plan to go to sea. It was never a long-term thing. Basically, I've, I found myself 18, 19, working in a, a betting shop in a tiny little village bore that on my mind and I decided that I needed to go and do something that didn't involve sitting in a betting shop in a tiny little village. And um, maritime appealed to me, um, the opportunities, the opportunity to, to do a degree and get paid and, and you know, come out with a qualification, a professional qualification, to see the world, you know, and, and basically experience a bit of life. And that's, that's why I pursued my uh, seafaring career. I studied at Plymouth University with, initially with P&O Ned Lloyd, which then got taken over by Maersk uh, on board container ships. Um, once I finished that, um, due to the uh, qualifying around 2008, 2009, it wasn't much, uh, it wasn't a great time for shipping. So um, Maersk didn't take the cadets on then. So I found myself looking for a job as a newly qualified officer. And as, as I'm sure many know, the, the difficulties newly qualified officers find looking for a job in that catch 22 situation where. You've got no experience, but no one's going to take anyone on if you haven't got the experience. So uh, eventually I found a job with Princess Cruises. I went away and did a trip with them. Um, and basically having been about 80% decided that the career for sea wasn't for me before that, I came back 100% decided that it wasn't for me. Um, so, yeah, like, like others, basically I just decided I wasn't going to go back. I was going to get a job ashore. I had no plan. I had no sort of inkling where I was going to go other than this um, sort of fact that we've been told all the way through our cadetship that you know you could you come in as a deck officer you can work you out and be captain you can be this you can come ashore and if you decide to leave you can probably find a job somewhere but there was no information on on where you go or what you do or what level of experience you need to have for which job and um so i came ashore imagining i'll just walk into somewhere and uh, that wasn't the case I found as a especially as a junior officer with relatively little seafaring experience um i now had not only did i have the you know, the, the original Catch-22, I've got enough experience, but like, you can't get experience because they won't give you a job. But then for the entry-level jobs, I was overqualified because I had the seafaring experience. So um, add to that, there also seemed to be quite a um, fixation from companies on, well, now you've been a sea, you've been institutionalized, so now you're going to, how are you going to adapt to to coming ashore? I thought, well, I've actually worked ashore longer than I've been at sea, but they seem to be fixated on this idea. I actually had an interview in a building over there. I can actually see the building, a different law firm, where um, about half of the interview was was grilling me on how am I going to adapt to coming ashore. I was like, well, I, I don't think I'm going to have a problem because I, I went to see, I didn't like it, but now I'm coming ashore. Um, but yeah, that, that was quite an experience. But um, eventually I found uh, a job with, it was maritime related, but not, not quite what I expected to be doing. It was working for a, a contract catering company where companies hand over the, uh, the catering budget to this company who then arrange the provisions and then take a cut. And I found, so I spent two to three years arguing with ship captains on why they can't have a hundred kilos of beef tenderloin. Um, 
But then eventually I kept my ear to the ground, I kept looking for opportunities and um, the, the job with Nautilus came up and I was lucky enough to, to get that uh, nearly eight years ago now. And that was a position um, under study in the, the head of professional technical at Nautilus at that time with a view that I would take over when he retired. And that happened about four years ago. In the meantime, uh, Nautilus very kindly paid for me to do a master's degree, which obviously, you know, on the CV balances out that, that I haven't got a master's ticket and I haven't got a chief officer's ticket, but I do have a master's degree. So that sort of balances out that, um, that gap on the CV. And uh, yeah, I've been doing that for eight years. I'm now head of UK PNT. Um, and uh, so I really just want to say what I learned in that process. So for me, the biggest issue overall when coming to was the lack of information. And I think this scheme will really help, you know, those people. I didn't have, I didn't know anyone working ashore in maritime, so I couldn't, didn't have anyone to, to give me those little tips. But the, um, yeah, the biggest issue was this idea for me that, um, you know, companies, they wanted to tell you how your maritime career could go, your seafaring career, but they're very reluctant to tell you what you can do in your shoreside career, because I think they have this idea. They certainly did then. I think it may have um, improved slightly, but they don't want to pay for your training and then lose you to shore, which in my mind is a bit short-sighted because if, if people struggle to find a related maritime career, then the whole industry has that experience. And where in the industry kind of it, it sent, if you're a captain or a chief engineer or a chief mate, then there's all sorts of, you know, companies run their management schemes. They want you, uh, they want you as a superintendent. They, if you're a junior officer, third officer, second officer, sometimes it can feel like you're um, without the master's ticket, they're not interested. And that for me is quite short-sighted because, you know, there's no reason why someone in the purchasing department or the planning department or HR department, why their experience is sure can't be very valuable for that company. Um, but really, I think the most important is, as we heard from everyone that's spoken to come ashore for me, is even though I jumped in with you know, no plan, no real idea where I wanted to go, as others have said, we've all ended up when, you know, where we want to be. So while it's, it's, you, it's good to have a plan, you're definitely going to do better if you can get advice off people, if you can, if you can speak to people, if you can get the, uh, the information that stops you, um, you know, going down the wrong route or, or jumping too soon. Um, that's definitely going to benefit you, but this career does offer an awful lot of opportunities. And even if you don't plan, you don't, you don't, you don't go out, go out in ideal circumstances. You still land on your feet if you keep trying, and you keep looking, and you keep making those connections. So that's why I definitely recommend this scheme and others to anybody looking to come ashore. Thanks. Thank you, David. Very nice, upbeat finish there. Thank you very much. And as we uh, all just heard, a very different journey to shore, right? Very different journey to what Fenner did. So as Fenner said, everybody has a different journey to shore. So thank you very much. Now I'd like to welcome two speakers who can tell us about their experience of the Sea to City mentoring scheme. First up is Mark Glasgow, Director Pacific Island Navigation Limited. Mark will describe his own very personal journey and why he wants to give back via the Sea to City scheme. Welcome, Mark. Helen, first of all, thank you very much for acting actually as my mentor, guiding me through these things. And having listened to the previous speakers, I feel that actually I can add very little. I thought Phil did a particularly good job in explaining every aspect of it. And in particular, uh, the fact that you look to an earlier and better generation to help you through. So taking those things to heart, one feels that maybe there's nothing further for me to say, which is probably quite encouraging. But uh, Helen would be disappointed if I didn't say something and my feeling is that life is a minefield and trying to complete the journey without stepping on a mine requires not only a degree of wisdom, but it also needs a fairly large slice of luck. Now, that latter commodity played a huge part in my career. The idea of ability is frankly a poor relation, but that's life. Rather like the others have said, uh, I have this touching belief that 
the maritime industry would be wonderful. I joined my first ship at the age of 16 in 1965 with a touching belief that having made it to ship's master, I would be highly sought after. It took me about 10 minutes to work out this assessment was radically wrong. It took a further 10 years to put matters right. And putting matters right again was down to luck rather than ability. I was lucky, I lucky to join a family owned firm called Holder Brothers. And at the midpoint of my seagoing career, I served as a second mate on the Cumbria, 32,000 ton geared bulk carrier, loading iron ore by hand in India. 30 days to load 30,000 tons was somewhat different to what we see today, but it allowed time to consider the future and arrive at the conclusion that LPG tankers would be a quicker route to promotion than dry cargo. That part of the plan worked well, and without going into tedious detail, other than to acknowledge it was good fortune, I did end up with command. As a chief officer, with a prospect of 10 years further service before even being thought of as master, I sought the help of Holder Brothers Chartering Director, one Peter Warwick, a man I'd met during the maiden voyage of the Cumbria. And I was rather hopeful he'd guide me in a change of career and see if this place called the Baltic Exchange would be a worthwhile place to work. Peter very kindly took me to lunch there to explain how it worked. And he kept on reassuring me, there's no money in this job, you know. And it was on the back of the lunch that he offered me a job as a trainee shipbroker. Whilst that was an excellent offer, it brought me into direct conflict, as David would have said, that when you're at sea, people don't want you to leave. And the managing director of Holders rather felt that he spent all this time training me, and the last thing he wanted me was to quit. And people tend to make offers to help themselves. And he offered me a job as command, thinking that would entice me back to sea because I'd just been offered a job by Peter Warwick as a trainee which was a bit of a strange thing because only 25 and to be given your own command at that age is lucky, unwise, unjustified. In a move of outstanding kindness, Peter Warwick allowed me to take the promotion on offer and he kept the job open for me for 12 months. So I ended up at the age of 25 in the South Pacific doing a job which I'd been trained to do but was probably not very good at and then 12 months later, turning up and being a trainee shipbroker. And it's that transition that maybe underlines the point that is frankly impossible, maybe at that stage, to step off one ladder onto the next one without taking several rungs down. And to this day, I remember going home on a Friday night in 1975, earning 8,000 pounds a year as a ship's captain all found, one day off for every two days served at sea. And on the Monday morning, turning up as a trainee on £2,000 a year, two weeks annual leave, knowing that if the phone rang, it would either be a wrong number or a question I couldn't answer. Peter wrote a letter to the Board of Holders in the 76, and it's still something I treasure. It read, I have this day given Mark Glasgow a job in the chartering department at £2,000 a year, it will probably be an unmitigated disaster that we have to start somewhere. So without laboring the point unduly, it has to be said that luck does play its part, but it's the work of the elder generation. And that is why I stand here today and why I'm trying to put something back into the industry because I wouldn't have made it today had it not been for the exceptional help of somebody who had no reason to help me. He wasn't a relative, he wasn't a friend. He just put himself out. Possibly he found something in common because uh, whilst he's very successful, ship owner, fifth generation, as Phil Perry would know, they have 10 ships. The idea of mortgage doesn't really appeal to them. Uh, but money was always the uh, guiding force for Peter, 
And when he took me to lunch on the Queen's Room in the Baltic, he selected steak and very expensive things. And I sat back and had gala pie, which was four and sixpence. And he asked if I wanted gala pie. I said, oh, yes, sir, I, I love gala pie. I love gala pie, but it was four and sixpence. And it clearly made all the difference to Peter, which is possibly why he uh, gave me the job. So uh, to end up this discussion, I try and be constructive. Starting again is not a recipe for embarrassment or penury. Indeed, Peter's words were wrong. I've made a great financial success of it. But it has taken something in the form of 40 years to get there. But coming ashore is a route to a better future. Now, without the support of somebody like Peter, and indeed somebody like my wife, I wouldn't have made it. But I have to admit, I wouldn't have made it either without a bit of luck, because allowing my ship to hit the wharf in Melbourne and merely slice open the pipe carrying seawater to the fire main rather than crude oil, that was luck. <laughs> so thank you all. And on that bombshell, we're all probably quite pleased that he did make that move ashore, aren't we? <laughs> thank you, Mark. Now we will hear from uh, one second officer who is currently taking part in the Sea to City programme. Second officer Ron Lamas is part of the first wave of our mentoring scheme and he has actually just paid off from his last contract in August. So it's all happening for Ron at the moment. Please welcome him to the lecture. Thank you, Helen. Uh, thank you, Nautilus and Mark for having me. Uh, yes, as she said, I um, did my last contract uh, on the ship. Actually, this has been a work in progress for two years trying to move ashore. Just didn't have any other clue or anyone to talk to about it. So this C2 schema product project actually uh, kind of helps. Actually, before I keep going on, I wanted to share to you a story that happened eight years ago and it's still been playing on my mind up to the event. I sat on a cab when I was a cadet on my way back to the academy to Fleetwood Nautical from the gym evening time. And uh, at the back of the cab, I started talking to the taxi driver. Turns out he was an ex radio operator. At that time, when I found out he was an ex radio operator, uh, I asked him, uh, why did you move ashore? Companies no longer needed radio operators. So he had to move ashore. He didn't know where to go to, who to talk to, and how to take his skills and experiences ashore. So he ended up as a taxi driver, which is, um, well, it's, not a, it's not a bad job, but he could have done more if he had the support, he had the information and everything. And uh, my last contract at sea, well, I, I just told the company, that's it. This is my final decision. I'm going to move ashore. And it's not just me just moving ashore. It's actually also uh, showing other seafarers who wants to move ashore the confidence and the possibilities ahead. As Mark says, you need a bit of luck. And I did say sometimes when all doors are closing, I think it's time to bring out the sledgehammer, start putting walls on the wall and see if we could get somewhere. Uh, but yeah. Um, most seafarers go through a lot of stress. They gain a lot of important skills, experiences, which they can take ashore. But the problem is they didn't know who to talk to and which how to approach companies and how to approach other people, which is why uh, I signed up for the project. And I'm talking to you guys now, <laughs> actually shaking myself uh, after f following the uh, other speakers. They actually well prepared. I think I'm just freestyling it now <laughs> and uh, yeah uh, I want this uh, project to uh, be successful because just to give more opportunities for seafarers who want to come ashore and also for them to value their skills and experience and not to waste their time at sea not to waste the time they spend at sea because they learned a lot of valuable things there resilience patience and the ability to smile under stress 
I think that's also maybe like a psychotic thing, but <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I really am optimistic about the project. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Ron, for that presentation. Just want to give a little plug now for all those Nautilus members or serving seafarers who may be currently looking for, uh, oh, sorry, to make that move ashore. You can find out more about the mentoring services through the uh, two email addresses on the big screen there. You can also attend our networking space after this event. It's on the Hopin platform and it will be open for 30 minutes after this event to speak to people who are going through the same things as yourself and to also potentially meet a mentor. So please do join us on Hopin after this event if you're interested in that. You can also sign up to be a mentee or a mentor uh, for this program, again, through those email addresses. So please do get in touch if you're interested in taking part in our program. Now we'd like to provide some more information on other projects that exist in the wider maritime sector, including the coming ashore project uh, from the Marine Society. So I would like to welcome Steve Cameron, representing the Marine Society to talk about that, alongside some of the challenges that the mentees are facing. Steve, warm welcome. Well, greetings everybody. And I have to admit, it is a very good view uh, from, from here. Great to see you all. And a particularly warm welcome to those of you that are contacting us on a, a remote basis. Really good to have you with us. Uh, the benefits of today provides you all with an opportunity to ask questions. As we've heard, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Can't say the same for the answer. So do, uh, when we get to that stage of the proceedings, do do please ask your questions. Uh, if I don't know how we are on time. I'm a bit worried Helen might put me on demurrage, but if she allows me uh, a, couple of, a couple of minutes just to personalise things before I talk about uh, the Marine Society and, and the mentoring programme. Um, like a lot of the previous speakers, coming ashore for me was uh, luck. Um, we, Fenner and I have attended other uh, debates on the subject where there's been a big discussion about whether you wait until you get your master's ticket or chief engineer's ticket, or whether you come ashore early. Frankly, there is no right or wrong answer, and it's really down to your own circumstances as to which route you, say, you take. What I would say is that if you can stay at sea, get your master's or chief engineer's ticket, it will give you more value when you decide to come ashore. In my case, I came ashore early. I was at sea with the same company that uh, uh, Mr. Gray uh, uh, was at sea with uh, um, and um, <clears throat> um, was casting around for a, a, um, a job ashore because I decided to come ashore early. Um, and uh, the fleet personnel woman, a delightful East End lady called Maggie War, said, Stevie, where have you been? I said, I'm looking for a shore job, Maggie. Come to the office. We've got a job in the office. So in those days um, uh, at sea, you either had your, in your wardrobe, you either had your uniform or you had what we used to call the going ashore gear. So I put my going ashore gear on. Uh, my friend drove me up from, from Tilbury, from the ship I was on. Uh, to uh, Cunard's offices in Marble Arch <clears throat> for my interview. Quite why, uh, having pushed my colleague's mini through a, 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 a cloudburst in, in the rain and appeared soaking wet, uh, they offered me the job. I, I'll never really know because my going ashore gear consisted of a, a black velvet suit, an electric blue shirt, a white kipper tie and a pair of stack heel python skin boots. <laughs> and and, and you know, I might have been better if I'd been applying for a job with variety. So even to this day, it still uh, amazes me that they offered me the job. Um, so mentoring with the Marine Society. The Marine Society has got a long, long history in helping seafarers. It was founded in 1756, establishing cruise libraries on board ships and expanded into an advice bureau, providing exams and education for seafarers as well. Today, it's also the umbrella organization for sea cadets. The Coming Ashore program is dedicated to help seafarers obtain the support and skills needed for the transition ashore that we've been hearing about 
and is a natural extension of, um, of their work. The programme provides a structured approach to transitioning ashore, resources to help research new roles, help with building a CV and online networking, sessions with an industry mentor, and personality profiling tools to help you understand who you are and therefore which roles you're, you're better suited to, and webinars and other support services. The current 10 mentors, of which a number of them are here today, uh, provide a wide range of skills and experience to mentees that range from commercial line of shipping, business development, and the provision of experts, a marine lawyer, a lecturer at the Institute of Chartered Shipbrokers, a ship surveyor, ex-Merchant Navy Training Board, uh, the MD of a chemical tanker ship management company uh, to an expert in marine security risk and an ex-super yacht and passenger ship officer. Um, uh, when I came ashore, I spent four years working in Cunard's uh, offices. I thought I was getting an unstructured management training program. I was headhunted to join the startup team that successfully ran a shipping line to West Africa for 20 years, where we ran roll on roll off ships, and it's the best fun I've ever had, I have to tell you. When I joined uh, OT Africa Line, I thought I knew from my four years in Cunard what line of shipping was all about. And actually, I discovered that all I'd learned was office politics. Uh, so given the choice between working for a large company or a small one, I would recommend a smaller one because you get a much broader education working for a smaller organization. We went from being technical managers of our department to a board of directors, and you learn everything, uh, uh, not just about operations of ships, but, but cash flow, agency contracts, HR, um, and growing a company from 12 to 1,200 people, you get to interview and employ a lot, of, a lot of people. And even today, when I see a good CV, I still get excited. And you can see that there are people out there with some, some great skills. And that, that's, that process of employing of those people and grow, working with a company that's grown has really uh, helped me. And it's such a delight to put something back as a mentor in, into the industry. Um, I don't want to put you off about coming ashore, but here are the challenges that we've seen that our mentees face that we as an industry need to address. Um, the first is that um, when you're at sea, the switch from a clearly defined structure at sea where your role and rank automatically define your responsibilities and authority to a position ashore where you have to gain the trust and respect of your team to become an effective leader is something of a challenge. And certainly we've seen with people come ashore that have struggled with that. Other issues include a lack of self-worth. How do my skills gained at sea relate to those needed ashore? And a number of our mentees haven't been sure, they haven't felt confident, you know, what, what role am I going to be suited for? And I have to tell you, as, a, as an employee of, of, of seafarers, the skills that seafarers bring ashore with them at any stage of their career are highly valuable. Uh, not just the experience of being at sea, but the, but the personal skills that they learn as well. The ability to build relationships and work with people across a wide range of cultures and right through the social structure gives you skill sets that people in the office just don't have. Uh, and at the very least, when you're on the telephone to somebody on a ship, sharing that thinks bubble with the captain about what's actually going on so that you 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 understand what he's talking about has a huge value. Getting to understand how the maritime industry works ashore and what it does to better appreciate the wide range of roles that are available. In this respect, gaining shore-based work experience during leave is, is really important. And if you're lucky enough to work for an organization that will listen to you, do put your name forward for shore-based roles for projects ashore. It'll help you understand how the industry works, it will build you a profile ashore uh, and potentially they may become uh, your, your next employer. Understanding the um, unique strengths and preferences that each mentee has that will define their value and therefore the roles that are suitable for them. This is really important. Everybody has different skill sets and they all have value, but unless you understand what they are, it's gonna be really difficult as Phil will tell you, to match your skill set against the job description. 
just because the job looks interesting, uh, don't apply for it unless you're sure that you have a good match with your skill sets. Otherwise, you're wasting your time and you'll just get disheartened with the rejections. Focus on those jobs where you can see you're, you're going to be able to provide value. So helping mentees recognize their USPs and how to develop networks to introduce them to those ashore is important. And it's here that professional organizations such as the Honorable Company of Master Mariners who operate their own mentoring program from cadet to captain, uh, the Nautical Institute, the recently formed the UK Maritime Professional Council, MRS, if you're an engineer, and of course, Maritime London, can help mentees develop the contacts needed for the foundations of a shore-based career. And that networking is, is, is really important. So um, um, thank you for listening to me. I hope that it's provoked some questions. And for those of you that are looking to come ashore, I do wish you good luck. Thank you, Steve. Uh, you had some very practical advice there, which I'm sure that a lot of people will find very useful listening into our event today. So thank you very much for that. I would now like to welcome all our speakers back onto the stage for our live Q&A. This is where our audience gets to put their questions to the speakers. So Steve, Fenner, Ron, Mark, and David, welcome to the stage. We do have some questions coming through on the Zoom uh, chat, but if anybody out there is watching on Zoom or Facebook Live, now is your chance to get some questions to the speakers and I will try and get them to them. We have a roving mic. Uh, who, here we go, Ben, the lovely Ben will be doing our roving mic today. So if you're in the audience and want to ask a question and the lovely Debbie as well, uh, if you want to ask a question in the audience, put your hand up and I'll do my very best to make sure that we cover everybody. If you are called upon, please just uh, say your name, perhaps where you're from, if you feel comfortable doing that, and direct the question to uh, an individual speaker if you uh, have it specifically for anyone. So I think I will take a liberty of asking the first question, if I may. And Ron, I thought I might put the first question to you if you don't mind you mentioned at the start of your speech that it took you a little while to move ashore and I know from chatting with you a little bit earlier that actually this is your second attempt at moving ashore what is different this time and uh, are you confident that it's going to be successful this time around uh, yes actually um, to answer that I'm just going to give you a metaphorical uh, no, um, story so imagine you're in a ship and you decide to move ashore, take a small boat, and then start paddling. Without a mentor, you're paddling and paddling until you end up to another ship who will pick you up because you're tired of paddling. With a mentor, it'll direct you to where you're going to end up paddling to the right direction so you don't waste a lot of energy just paddling to nowhere or to a deserted island. And then you end up paddling, getting picked up by another ship. Uh, did that answer your... Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very nicely. Please don't paddle to Norway or to a desert island. Get a mentor and get focused and come to shore. I thought I might put another, a second question, perhaps to Fenner, but anybody can answer this. Do seafarers need to have master's qualifications to get the best opportunities when they come ashore? Uh, I have to say no to that because I don't have a master's degree. It'd be very hypocritical to say yes. Um, it's so difficult because in some roles you will need it. It will be an essential, not a desirable. But I do think particularly for females that we think we can't do things that actually we probably can do. And I think the same can be uh, put on to having a master's ticket or not having a master's ticket. You just need someone to kind of believe that you can be taught things and uh, build up to that level rather than having a master's ticket to come ashore with. It sounds a little bit daft, but I, I know what I'm saying. Um, it, it's it's never going to be resolved, that question. Uh, it does have to suit the person. I couldn't have stayed at sea until I got my master's. I wasn't ever interested in being a master. And the opportunities are slightly limited, I would say. But the company I'm currently with brought me on because I came ashore early enough that they could mould me into what they needed me to be rather than come ashore later on, be a certain way, and then not want to back down into uh, what they now needed me to be. I would also just add, 
it's much easier, I think, to come ashore earlier because the pay that you're expecting is a, a lot easier to reconcile with than coming ashore as a master mariner. You can build it up a lot quicker. That's a different story. No, absolutely. And Mark also reflected that in your presentation, didn't you? Now, you correct me if I'm wrong, folks, you are the only person with a master's ticket. Do you want to respond to that question there? Do you think that you uh, maybe a few steps forward, you get more opportunities if you do come ashore once you have that ticket? That's a very fair question. I think that uh, my colleague has spoken with such charm. I don't think I can really add to it. The, the fact that I have a master's ticket uh, was useful, but I think that as we've seen here, having a natural charm and an ability is far more important. And that is probably uh, the answer to your question. Yes, it is convenient. Uh, I was lucky to have achieved my master's ticket. Uh, I will freely admit that I got it probably by default because I decided that I would look to see if the 10 questions I knew the answers to came up in the examination paper, and they did. So uh, that was useful. But going back to the, the important part, is a master's ticket? No. It is your own personality and your ability to be flexible. And that is probably the crux of the whole point, is that by the time you finally decided to come ashore and cast aside what is a very good salary and a nice social position to find yourself in as a ship's master, you're master under God and everybody's towing the line. By the time you got to that stage, you are inflexible. And that was something I picked up earlier on, that by coming ashore early, you are flexible enough to be molded into the sort of employee that uh, your company would like. Yep, absolutely. Thank you. Now, you have mentioned a couple of times the financial privations that you may have to suffer when you first move ashore. What financial support is available, either for retraining or uh, any other type of financial um, support for seafarers considering a move ashore? David, do you know of any? Um that's actually available now. There used to be some money available from the MEF. I'm not sure if that's still available. Um, if you've been made redundant, there's the uh, Mar uh, Marine Society uh, retraining fund if you become unemployed as a result of the pandemic. But um, outside of maritime, you know, that's where I've looked. There's all sorts of grants and schemes for, for retraining into certain careers, teaching, drafting teachers. But for actual retraining in maritime ones, it's not. Mm -hmm. Anyone on the panel have any insight into any extra support financial that seafarers could uh, avail themselves of? I think this is part of the problem, isn't it? We're all sitting here saying we're, we're aware of all this information and how we can help, but actually it comes down to it. We're not hugely aware of the information that's out there. But it is out there, you've just got to, to look for it. Alan, I think you've asked a very valuable question. Uh, and I think that in my day, uh, there was no support whatsoever. And without being too cosy about it, what one hoped is that you'd find a pretty girl who was affluent and she would help you on the shore. <laughs> now, with all due respect to my amazingly supportive wife, she was pretty, but she wasn't affluent. And uh, I still managed to make it. But it is a huge worry for anybody. You do need support financially and socially. That is the one thing that yeah, is possibly important for all of us here today as mentors to try and put something back. And that is the thing that is missing. Yeah, absolutely. I have got a question that has come through on the chat. It's from somebody who a lot of us in this room will know very well. Uh, it's from Doug Barrow, and it's a little bit long, so bear with me. <laughs> Five years ago, following an industry survey, the Ship to Shore seminar was held at Trinity House. Some of us were there, we may remember it. A lot of the topics that were discussed then are being discussed again now. So Doug would like to know, does the panel think that the industry has addressed the missing skills gaps or are seafarers today as equally unprepared as they were five years ago? Who would like to take on that one? 
one. I spoke about it five Did years you? ago. Um, so I can't believe it was five years ago. Oh, <laughs> um, uh, and I, I do think it has changed, if I'm totally honest. When I started at Crystal and Beyond, uh, we had a, a rebrand and a big shake up of the information that was then put out to, to be more available to people. Social media has really helped with all of that and the messaging. And I think seafarers are more aware now of how they can access that information using social media and speaking to people than they certainly were when I was looking to come ashore or even people before me. Um, I think we all have to admit there are still massive gaps and we do have some work to do, but it's also on the seafarer themselves to go and find that information. We can sit here and put it out, but people have to take it upon themselves. We're not here to find people jobs. They have to really take ownership of their job search. It's like moving when you are short, you have to own it. Um, so yes and no, I personally think that's what we to um, yeah, I'll just add, I think the conversation has moved along in these sort of uh, forums. I think there's more of a recognition now that people aren't going to be at sea for their entire careers. I think companies are, are at least talking about the need to, to make sure that uh, seafarers have soft skills, transferable skills, and that we can get people ashore and keep on within the industry uh, if they come ashore earlier in their career. But whether that's quite a field down to the coalface, I'm not sure. But I think the conversation is moving in the right direction. Steve. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, uh, coming back to your previous question about funding for, for seafarers, I saw some gesticulations coming from my colleagues from the Marine Society over here. It looked a bit like seven or four, I couldn't really tell. Um, uh, and so so it, it may be worth having a chat with them, or, or they, they may want to say something later on uh, about some of the things, the things they're doing. Um, in terms of in terms of uh, where we've got to in, in coming short uh, for seafarers. We did um, we did a study for a, a client um, where they promoted the chief officer to captain who had an accident on his first trip. And it wasn't the million dollar damage that he'd done that was the concern. It was the fact he'd been through their vetting process for promotion and it shocked them rigid that it hadn't worked. Um, so we reviewed that and, and put some bits and pieces back in place for them uh, so that it was more robust and, and more strategic, uh, but basically they made the mistake of assuming that because somebody was a good chief officer, they'd be a good captain, uh, which isn't always the case. But we also benchmarked the process of selecting and how the best companies select and train and promoted their, their seafarers. And as Steve mentioned earlier, Helen, um, one of the leading providers was, was actually uh, developing projects that required sea staff and shore staff to collaborate together. Um, and as a consequence of that, not only were they making better decisions, uh, but it was helping seafarers understand what the roles were ashore before they came ashore by building these, uh, these, these collaborative teams. And, and by bringing them ashore into the office, they could add value uh, to the process ashore. And it was almost like um, uh, a, a, a coming ashore apprenticeship someone so that when they were ready they, they knew a lot more about what was what was available um, uh, to them uh, uh, we're about to see a much bigger change that will affect the lives of seafarers in terms of technology uh, and we're hearing about artificial intelligence uh, and we're seeing how ports and terminals are becoming automated that requires less people on the terminal and that process is accelerated during COVID quite significantly. Uh, and we know that it's going to affect seafarers with respect to how, how ships are manned. Um, but, uh, but the process of a fully automated ship is, is, is um, a long way away. And there will be lots of steps uh, along that journey, uh, which will require seafarers to have a greater degree of understanding of the technology that's, that's actually involved. So how, uh, you know, so, Effectively, if somebody ashore is a really good gamer, yeah, then they may that may be the sort of skills that we need from our, our, our future seafarers as, as, as they get involved in, in in the new technology that's that's coming along. And we need to start thinking about how we we write into our our program for training seafarers those skills that will give them value not just now but in, in the future for the for, for role for sure because one thing is for sure we've de we've we've heard today the value that seafarers bring when you put them in a shore environment 
and, and that value is going to be just as relevant in 10 years' time when they're managing the technology. Thank you, Steve. Um, I have got another question coming through on the chat. It's all about skills as well, but slightly different uh, seagoing skills. The question is, are there roles out there for onboard HR professional to transition without a great deal of retraining, but still maintain the level or grade that we have on board? Maybe very specific question there. Anyone on the, the panel think they can tackle that question? We might need to get Phil Parry up here to, to answer that one for us. Not quite sure. Okay, maybe whoever uh, posted that one on the chat, if you can clarify, we will come back and we will put it to our panelists again. What about existing cadet training? Do we need to incorporate the skills, the shore-based skills that those cadets will potentially one day need to have when they uh, transition to shore? What do we think about including that type of training into cadetships, David? Um, yeah, I think so. As, as I alluded to before, I think there's a recognition now that people aren't going to be um, necessarily you know, starting a career at sea and then staying for 20, 30 years. They're going to be looking to move ashore at some point. And as we mentioned with technology, the nature of the role is going to change significantly throughout someone's career if they start right now. So there is um, a lot of talk about soft skills and you know, sort of transferable skills that you need to adapt throughout your career. Uh, the MSC um, cadet report has recommended that we move more towards degrees for cadets, which I absolutely support. I think that would help people um, to, to adapt and transition later in their careers. And, and we may need to look at, um, you know, one of the key things I found, as I, as I mentioned uh, in my, my presentation earlier, was um, that companies feel that um, they're going to, people are going to struggle coming ashore. So we might need to look at that, you know, uh, a unit in a cadet training or a separate course where people can can you know, look at those office skills and have that on their CV so they don't get those problems. Yeah, Mark, did you want to come in on that? No, I think you made a very valid point there, David, because there was a reluctance for the employer who see their sea staff where they've trained them. They don't want them to quit and come ashore. It was as blunt mm -hmm. as that. And uh, I can see that directly from my own experience where the managing director of the company was quite livid that what was then a young chief officer would want to come ashore. How dare you? you know, and the idea that you bring into the cadetship now, the idea that there are shore-based skills is only fair. It's only fair to the younger generation. And the reality is you're going to lose the sea staff to a certain extent, not everybody to go to sea at 16 and not be there until they're 65. Possibly the more quality members of the staff will want to come ashore. So let's meet the problem before it becomes a problem and introduce into the cadetship skills that are shore-based skills so that the officers are interchangeable. And if we've arrived at this curious situation, which admittedly is slightly foreign to me, where officers are both engineers and navigating officers, well, I'm sure we can bring it to cadets being both shore-based and sea-based. Yeah. Who's just, oh, sorry, Phil, did you want to put a question? Yeah. Can we get the speaker, Ben? Do we have a, and then, yep. Thanks very much. Yeah. The you got say me? a few words and we'll find out. I'll say a few words. How's it's, that? It's on, Jolly yes. good. There's, um, for, for a long time, there's been a, um, uh, a perception that, yes, you may have to have a master's ticket and, um, uh, and, and, and various other things. You may have to have a degree and so on. But as I uh, inarticulately said earlier on, it, it's not a one-size-fits-all uh, approach. And I think everybody's made that very clear uh, today. But if, I wouldn't mind just picking up on a couple of bits, and I promise not to be too long. But... Um, financial support was one of the questions. And the one thing I've always said to, to young seafarers is, is save money while you're at sea. It's, it's tax-free. You will earn less when you come ashore unless you're damn lucky. Um, uh, and you'll certainly be taxed when you come ashore. So save money while you're at sea. And if you're thinking of coming ashore and you're earning a reasonable amount of money at that point, get your mortgage then before you come ashore because they'll pay you less 
the banks will give you less when you come ashore and you're earning less money and being taxed than they will while you're at sea. So do a bit of forward planning um, and get yourself a nice chunky mortgage before you, before you come ashore. Um, and um, just a little bit about uh, shore training. Um, with the STCW Manila amendments, uh, what came in was um, HELM, Human Element Leadership and Management Requirements. And at first I was very skeptical that this was anything other than lip service, but slowly, slowly the industry is doing a better job now of embracing leadership and management development training. And I think that's going to be helpful for people wanting to come ashore because the companies who are investing in, in doing that properly are doing a good job now of personality profiling, uh, showing seafarers a bit of their own personalities back to them and show, getting them to have a bit of self-awareness. Uh, and um, Mark was explaining so much of it today is about charm and personality, and he's absolutely spot on because so many people have degrees nowadays that actually it's becoming very difficult to distinguish between them. And so we're going back uh, to this um, uh, age-old uh, fanciful notion that personality might actually have something to do with uh, success, uh, which is, I think, a good thing. And, um, uh, and, and so this, this investment in leadership and management training is now starting to look real rather than just something in the regulations. And, and you know, and long may that continue. And, you know, to anyone who's listening, who's an HR professional working for a ship owner, you know, do invest in doing that properly rather than just ticking a box. Okay, thank you, Phil. We do have a question at the back here. Uh, we have a couple of questions coming in. I will get you all, I promise. Let's start off with uh, Steve Gudgeon. Did you have a question? Um, yeah, first of all, I'd just like to say it's really great to be in a room with somebody who also started with um, Holder Brothers. I started in 72, so, um, but I don't remember your name, but I was a lowly cadet in 72. Um, I've spent all my career at sea. Um, apart from a short time um, in the 80s when I became a police officer when British Merchant Navy um, f fell in a bit of a heap um, and then I was very fortunate to have maintained all my qualifications which is something people can't do now but I maintained all my qualifications and which allowed me to go back to sea when I was uh, in the 90s when um, when things things progressed again. Um, I've now um, made a decision that um, I want to come ashore. Um, I'm still employed as a master, um, deep sea, um, but I've made a decision that I want to come ashore um, primarily a little bit earlier than I would, uh, was expecting to do because of, because of COVID and the, the crew change crisis. I just don't feel that I can, um, I have the, the mental capacity anymore or the physical capacity anymore to stay on board a ship for eight and 10 months at a time, which my colleagues are having to do at the moment. So I've, I'm coming ashore early. Um, I want to look at, I thought I would like to look at mentoring to uh, maintain that link with, with seafaring because I, I still feel I've got a lot to offer. Um, I would never have, I would never have left now if it hadn't been for the COVID crisis. Um, but I want to I want to continue to do something. Now, what you've um, said today makes me wonder whether to be able to do what I want to do now and continue to have some involvement with seafaring, I also need a mentor. So I'm in a dilemma where I I might want to mentor and be a men, my, my, a mentee. You um, can absolutely make that happen, Steve. Um, yeah. <laughs> Come talk to so, us afterwards. Um, so yeah, I've, I've really, I can, I can take something away from here and feel a bit more confident about the future because it is a very scary experience thinking about coming ashore for obvious reasons, mm -hmm. which you, some of which you have mentioned already. Um, but um, let's, let's see where we go from here. Thank you very much. Look folks, I'm gonna give us an extra five minutes for the Q and A. It was meant to wrap up now, but I know that we've got a couple of people in the audience who'd like to put some questions. Fraser, can I move to you? And then we will move over to this side of the room. Uh, Mark, uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's Fraser Matthew. I'm a servant captain at the minute, uh, involved heavily with Nautilus International. Questions for Ron, really. Uh, obviously, you've just come off your last ship. Uh, making your second move ashore, how was it received with the other crews and officers on board? You know, was it supported or, well, I expect a sort of negative, you know, you're going ashore? <clears throat> uh, 
sorry, uh, you mean if uh, the crew supported my decision? Yeah. Actually, it's my own decision and it's my future. So uh, whether they were on board or not, yeah, I actually um, didn't really care. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's a very difficult stand to make, you know, and I can't, I mean, it, you know, some people would make it easier if it was a supported decision. And I think, you know, people see that you're leaving the seat for those same reasons why you're doing it and it won't work. And, uh, you know, it, how dare you leave the sea, you know, and, and, and go to work ashore. It's encouraging for me, the rest of the panel, to see how much passion you still have with the industry. And, you know, we have this perception, if you leave the sea, you give up on the industry at all. And we really need people like yourself who have probably more passion than we do on ships to, to keep it going for, from the shore side. So it's a big thank you to, to all of you for, for still being passionate about industry um, and, you know, really good luck ashore. Thank you. Another question over here, please. Uh, sorry, uh, oh, can sorry, I just Ron. add something? Uh, sure. Uh, actually, um, when you move ashore, you're actually uh, not just moving ashore, you're leaving a lot of things behind, leaving the opportunity to work with great people on board the ship. But at the end of the day, you gotta, you gotta make a decision, stay at sea and uh, miss a lot of things at home. Because uh, what I found is the more contracts I take on the ship, the further away I get from home. So that's also, one of the big reasons why I'm moving ashore. But yeah, you're right. It, it also takes a special type of people to stay on board the ship, do the job, do a lot of sacrifice, spend uh, their evenings on their own, and then I uh, wonder how their families are doing uh, back home. So I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Um, Daryl Bate from the Marine Society. So coming back to a question we, we raised earlier about the, whether you should have a master's ticket before you come ashore. Um, but until the officer cadet training recognizes it or moves to a degree level profession, you're still going to find yourself needing to top up to get a degree. And uh, in order to compete you know, in the marketplace, the employability marketplace with those who've got degrees. So great to hear that someone like David, you know, you were sponsored by your employer, which is a fantastic example. But I would absolutely recommend that... Um, using the generous leave arrangements if you're at sea uh, to, to use that to study distance learning for degree. And, um, you know, someone mentioned earlier, we do have <laughs> scholarships uh, or bursaries that can support that. We have links with Portsmouth and, and Southampton University where we, we can, uh, through us, we can make a, there's a discount uh, arrangement for studying. And of course, if you're a UK national and resident, you'll be eligible for a student loan grant anyway. But but let's not forget the degree is the important sort of base point in order to compete in the marketplace. And I'm glad that the cadet training reviews are recognizing that and, and saying that actually needs to be the outcome. Uh, if you're a master mariner and you, you know, um, to think that's not yet a degree profession compared with so many other professions ashore just seems a travesty to me. So that's more of a comment than a question, but others may want to chip in. Yes, absolutely. Just Fair to enough. Be the difficult one, I'm really sorry. I'm probably the only person that on the panel doesn't have a degree. I don't have A-levels, I went to see it at 16. I think it's only a barrier if you left it. I think it's absolutely right, go get as many qualifications. Some people will say, we'll give you qualifications, we'll put you through things, and, and it might not happen, they say to you at sea, I'm sorry, I could go and get my, my chief mate's ticket, and that never came to anything. You have to make the decision yourself, and, and like I said earlier about the advice, you'll get lots of different advice from lots of different places, and it really has to be what, you need it to be. If I'd have waited to get a degree or if I'd have topped up, I wouldn't be sitting here now doing, I'd have been on a completely different course. So, uh, yeah, I, I struggle with it sometimes because I can't sit here and say that you must have a degree, you must have a master's degree. It doesn't stop you unless you let it. And I think Fenn has just described just how personal the journey is for everybody, isn't it? And whereas the degree will really help a lot of people to reach where they want to be and give it that proper structure to the training, it's not for everybody and it won't get everybody to where they need to go. Final wrapping up, if you can keep it to one minute, Mark. <laughs> 30 seconds. Fenner is a perfect example of, on paper, she may not have the qualification that one might first look at, but my goodness, she's got the personality that wins everything. Okay. Thank you, folks. Thank you very much for uh, attending today. Unfortunately, we are out of time. All our seafarers managed to stay on time for their presentations, but I ran over. So my apologies. I clearly haven't had the training. Um, any additional questions that we didn't get to, uh, or if you think of anything over the next few days, please do post those questions to hop in, and we will seek to answer those as soon as possible. Please join me in thanking our speakers for their time.
lots of really good information there, both practical and personal as well. So thank you very much, speakers. I'd also like to thank Norton Rose Fulbright for hosting this event. And of course, Nautilus International and Maritime London for running the Sea to City Mentoring Scheme. A recording of the event will also be available on Hopin. So if it once isn't enough, please go back and watch it all again. Again, Nautilus members and any seafarers who are wishing to contact mentors and to find out more about the Sea to City program can join our breakout rooms after the event. It will be open for the next 30 minutes, so please do join us there. Thank you to all our attendees. I hope you found this event useful. We look forward to seeing you at another event in future. Thank you and good afternoon. Well and for those of us who are staying with us now, we do have some lunch out on the terrace, so please do come and say hello. Oh, nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you very much.